Okay. So all of yeah, it's it's two thirty, right? Yes. We were supposed to start at two o'clock. <laughs> It's okay. All right. So um, this is going to be the the last major sort of application of uh, phylogenetics that we will talk about. Uh, so what I'm going to do is sort of give you a background on about what biogeography is all about and how it was practiced in the past and how we are practicing biogeography today. Why is it interesting? Uh, why is it important to have phylogenies? Uh, particularly dated phylogenies, right? So uh, uh, a dated tree or a time tree is, is, is really very important uh, input in, in uh, studying biogeography. Okay, um, I'm sure most of you have uh, seen this, uh, this uh, image. Uh, this is the original uh, image from which it's been taken. Uh, so biota, both, both uh, you know, flora and fauna, uh, have been divided into these major uh, realms, biogeographic realms. Uh, so that's Palearctic region, that's Ethiopian, that's Oriental, Australian, uh, uh, Neotropical, and, and Neoptic, I think it's called. So uh, this work was done by Wallace, right? Um, uh, the co-discoverer, discoverer, by the way, of uh, the uh, theory of uh, natural selection, uh, you know, uh, theory of evolution through nat natural selection. Okay, now, what is it that Wallace has done here? How did he come up with these biogeographic realms? Any thoughts? Huh? Uh, climatic conditions are somewhat similar in many of these places. Yeah. What else uh, uh, is uh, important? Similar, similar animals in similar uh, uh, habitats or the latitude. Uh, uh, yeah, so they do have similar composition of animals. Yes, that's that's very true, and they tend to also have similar. You know, they fall within sort of similar climatic zones, um, but there's one one other thing that is missing here, which many of huh? Connectivity. Connectivity, exactly. So often many of these uh, biogeographic realms are separated by barriers. So these realms are regions that have, by and large, similar environmental conditions. They are usually separated by a barrier. And the species composition, uh, there is a turnover in species composition as you go from one realm to another. right? So uh, it, it gives you an idea of, about the spatial distribution of, uh, uh, of species. right? So that's what biogeography is all about. Uh, it studies the distribution of species. Uh, in the past, people were just looking at space, how are species distributed in space. But now, biogeography includes the time component also. Right? Um, so, so they are called uh, regions or realms, not biomes. Biomes should not be here. Biomes is actually uh, a very, has a very different uh, meaning. So these, these are natural blocks of areas with sim similar environment and habitat with distinct evolutionary trajectories. That simply means that if you go from one biogeographic realm to another, there is turnover of, of, of species, right? Um, Biomes are more, more like uh, desert is a biome, rainforest is a biome, right? Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, basically habitat uh, that occupy a particular uh, environmental zone. Um, 
So just keep that in mind. Biomes does not fall in this. So it's regions or realms. Okay. Now, uh, what is it uh, very unique about the Australasian biogeographic realms? Can you name a few species? Kangaroos, yeah, basically all the marsupials. Uh, the mammalian fauna of Australia is, is largely marsupials, right? The only placental mammal there is the dingo. And then, of course, whatever, whatever else we humans took with us. Uh, plants, What's, and can you name some plants? Eucalyptus, yes. We were talking about phylogenetic diversity and not to include eucalyptus when you are looking at <laughs> diversity in India, right? Because it's from a completely different biogeographic realm. Right? Uh, what about the oriental realm in, in which India falls? What are some of the species uh, that are unique to the oriental realm? Rhino? Uh, rhinos are also found in where? Africa, right? Asian elephant, yeah. Tiger. Tiger. yeah. Bengal tiger. Yeah, Bengal tiger. Well, in the past, not very long ago, they were they had a much wider distribution. By the way, in Siberia, you have uh, Siberian tiger. There were a couple of other subspecies of uh, tiger, Caspian tiger, and you know, so that so tigers have had a much wider distribution in very recent past, right? Uh, huh? Pheasants, that's a good one. That might be a, yeah, I think uh, South, uh, Southeast Asia and uh, India. Uh, yeah, maybe pheasants also. Because King cobras? Pheasants are not found in Africa. King cobra is a uh, good example. Yeah, so basically, you know, species that are found only in this realm and nowhere else in the world, right? And often those species are also related with each other, okay? All right, so that's the Oriental realm. Uh, it's also sometimes called uh, Indo-Malayan region. Uh, and then this region is again further subdivided into the Indian sub-region, the Indo-Chinese sub-region, and the Sundayak sub-region, right? Anyway, uh, okay. So study of distribution of species, that is distribution of biodiversity in space and time. Uh, what I showed you was just space. How is biodiversity distributed in space? But now we bring in the time component. Uh, and we, in today's biogeography, we ask questions like, what are the events in the past that have contributed to current distribution of species? Right, so now we are bringing in the time component. Uh, the events that I'm talking about here is past climatic and environmental changes, geological events, which has many of these events have led to extinctions in some cases, and in other cases, speciation, right? Um, and when you use phylogenies to understand biogeography, it's called historical biogeography, because you're looking at evolutionary histories of species and trying to understand their biogeography. So that's why it's called historical biogeography. Okay, so how can we use phylogenies, right? So what we do uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the area of historical biogeography is we take species phylogenies, like in this uh, area here, you have three species, S1, S2, and S3, and they are separated, uh, their distributions is separated by these barriers, and this is the phylogeny of uh, these three species. S1 is distributed in area A1, S2 in B, and S3 in C, and so on. Uh, and the question then is, how did this distribution come about? Okay. Uh, a more real life example is that of uh, these uh, tarantulas of the genus Poisolotheria. Uh, there are, I think, about 13 species, um, and each of them have a certain distribution. Uh, there are five species in uh, Sri Lanka and eight in India. Uh, and here's the phylogeny, right? So now you can start asking the question, uh, do the Sri Lankan ones cluster together, the Indian ones cluster together, or they all intermixed? 
did they go from India to Sri Lanka? Uh, was there any back dispersal from Sri Lanka into India? So these are the kinds of questions one can begin addressing in the area of historical biogeography, right? So uh, here's again a cartoon of how you know species distributions come about and how phylogenies are, are uh, very useful in understanding what happened in the past, right? Okay, so this is an area, you know, one large area and this, there's a species distributed in that area. Uh, over time, there's a barrier that arises and we have talked about this uh, on numerous occasions. Uh, eventually, these two uh, subpopulations, you know, that are on either side of the barrier evolve into distinct species. Right? And here's a phylogeny that shows how these two species are related. Okay. Uh, now let's say that in area B there was another barrier that emerges. Uh, again, species S2 is now divided into two subpopulations, and then eventually those two subpopulations diverge uh, to become two different species. So what you have see, seen, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, the, uh, a sequence of uh, vicarians events. So this is called a vicarians event, right? That results in allopatric speciation, basically. Um, and the oldest vicarian event here corresponds to this split, and the younger one corresponds to this split, right? And uh, so the phylogeny here mirrors these vicarian events. So. If you have this distribution and this phylogeny, uh, you know, you, you begin to, uh, you, so one of the first conclusions you're gonna make is that, you know what, the earliest split was between S1 and the common ancestor of S2 and S3, so probably this barrier was really old, right? And this barrier arose more recently, okay? All right. Um, yeah, so these are the two uh, vicarians events, and if we can, you know, the dating part I'll come uh, in a little bit. So we are just basically saying this is an older uh, uh, split and this is a younger split. Okay, so that is vicarians. Now you could also have dispersal. Uh, this is a scenario where that species S is dis distributed in this part of uh, the, the area. Uh, and is absent, so basically here the barriers are, have, are already there. In the earlier example, you had a widespread species that had expanded its range, and then you had a barrier that arose, right? In this case, the barrier is already there, and the species in question is found only in one small part of, part of the, the larger landscape, right? Uh, one can imagine a situation where few individuals of uh, species S manage to, you know, cross the barrier and colonize area B. Okay, and because there is still a barrier, there, there's lack of gene flow. Uh, eventually, that species now, uh, that population now speciates to give you a new species, and subsequently. A subpopulation of S2 then crosses over the barrier here, gets to area C, and you have species S3, right? Now look at the phylogeny. It is identical to the phylogeny we got earlier, but this is a dispersal scenario, whereas the earlier scenario was vicarians, where the emergence of barrier has resulted in isolation of a subpopulation and eventually speciation. Whereas here, you know, barrier has already been there, uh, species have uh, crossed the barrier, got isolated, and then you have speciation. Now, how do you distinguish between these two? Right? Uh, that is where uh, time trees are important because the, the, the topologies are identical. Here, all the speciation event has occurred, occurred after the emergence of barrier. Whereas here, the speciation event is congruent with the, oh, so this is still dispersal. Uh, in, uh, yeah, in, in case of uh, vicarians, the speciation event is, the timing of speciation event is congruent with the time when the barriers emerged. So you can date the phylogeny 
then look at uh, look at the geological uh, evidence for when those uh, barriers uh, emerged. If it turns out that uh, this radiation is younger than the, those barriers, then you know it's dispersal. Right? Okay. Now, uh, a classic example is that of uh, Gondwana vicarians. So, if you, uh, I'm sure you, you guys have read about this. Uh, all these land masses, South America, Africa, Sri Lanka, the Indian Plate, and Australia, were all part of a, of a southern continent called Gondwana, and eventually this continent split. Uh, so, if you if you think about a species that is distributed in all those uh, the unbroken Gondwana, uh, and when the Gondwana uh, broke apart, you have subpopulations that got isolated in these different places, and eventually you have different species, right? So this would be vicarians. Um, so that's the scenario. Or maybe this group is really young. After the, the continents had broken apart, this group evolved in Africa and then dispersed wherever else, right? That could also be the case. So if you now did the phylogeny, you will uh, be able to figure that out, right? So in the classic Gondwana breakup uh, scenario, the earliest breakup is between East and West Gondwana. So if you now build a phylogeny consisting of species from all these land masses, uh, you should get two clusters, Africa, South America versus India, Madagascar, and Southeast Asia. And this date here should correspond, the molecular date here, uh, should correspond to the time when East and West Gondwana split. And you have subsequent uh, events, you know, that would also correspond to other vicarians. So the example that I often give is that of cichlids. Um, it has pantropical distribution, and the phylogeny of the global phylogeny of uh, cichlids matches beautifully with the Gondwana, Gondwana vicarians scenario. So you have Madagascar, India, East Gondwana, South America, Africa branching together uh, in this tree. So you don't have to look, you know, pay attention to what's written there, but basically here is the, the condensed form. So this is like a East-West Gondwana split. But when they dated the phylogeny, they realized that the group was really young, right? So it probably uh, evolved in one of the continents and eventually made it to the other continents. So anyway, so that's why dates are very important in historical biogeography. Okay. But what we will be doing uh, is another way to sort of distinguish between dispersal and vicarians uh, when you have a phylogeny like this, because as I said, without the dates, you, 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 it, this could be dispersal or vicarians. So another way to uh, get around this problem is to look at what are called area cladograms. Right? Uh, it does not completely solve the problem, but it gives you more clarity. And then if you now bring in uh, the time component, then it becomes much better. But what's an area cladogram? You replace the species name with areas, right? So now this is this is sort of showing how these areas are in a way related to each other, right? So then uh, uh, a, a typical vicarian scenario, for example, would be that the ancestral species had a wide distribution, A, B, C. The earliest vicarians event was between area A and B, C, followed by another vicarians event between B and C. This personal scenario would be something like so, where the species was distributed in, uh, you know, say, uh, A. That's the one that uh, we have been discussing, I think. Yeah, anyway. Uh, was distributed in A. It dispersed to B, so you got A, B. And uh, then there was a separation between A and uh, AB. And from B, it dispersed to C. And there was separation from uh, between B and C. Right? So this would be a, a typical uh, uh, dispersal scenario. Right? Uh, so one of the earliest programs that 
does this kind of analysis, uh, I would say this is the UPGMA of uh, biogeography. Okay, <laughs> historical biogeography. Uh, if you sort of understand how this works, then other things get easier because now you and here you have likelihood approach. That is what we'll be using eventually. Uh, but let's understand the UPGMA approach. Okay, so you you make your uh, uh, area cladogram. So basically this, you replace the species name with uh, <clears throat> areas, right? And now what you want to figure out is the ancestral area. Then once you have the ancestral area, then you'll be able to figure out whether something was a vicarians or a dispersal. And along which node it happened. <clears throat> and if you date the phylogeny, you can then figure out when that dispersal event happened or when that vicarians event happened. <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, DIVA or dispersal vicarians analysis uses uh, uh, parsimony. You know, uh, so it tries to come up with the most optimal ancestral reconstruction. So it's just like parsimony, right? And uh, <clears throat> uh, optimal reconstruction of ancestral distribution, in, and it involves a search for the reconstruction with minimum dispersal extinction cost. So it tries to reduce uh, dispersal. Uh, and uh, also extinction, uh, and it uses the parsimony criteria, okay? And it uses few rules, so it says that the optimal distribution of the ancestral node cannot contain a, a unit area not occupied by any descendant. So basically that cannot be true. Okay, that's the first rule. If this is A and this is B, this has to be either A, B, or A, or B. It can't be something completely different. It's like saying, you know, there's a species that is distributed, these two species, this is distributed in India and this is distributed in Sri Lanka, so the ancestor is in South America. <laughs> right? does not make sense. Okay, so <clears throat> this is fine. This is also fine because at least one area is represented there. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, the other thing it says is that speciation within area and allopatric spe uh, speciation between area cost is zero. So there is no cost for. Uh, let's call this sympatric speciation and allopatric speciation would be vicarians. Okay, so there's no cost for speciation within area and no cost for allopatric speciation. Uh, dispersal is the addition of one or more unit, unit to an area, right? So dispersal is, so here it's gone from A to B, so you're adding one more unit. So dispersal is addition of one unit, so there's cost. So you are penalizing dispersal. And I think this is sort of a naive idea that, you know, dispersal is difficult. So cost, whereas uh, allopatric speciation, you're not really doing any, any work. You know, it's just that there's a barrier that has arisen and you've got isolated, right? Uh, extinction is deletion of one or more areas, uh, uh, more uh, unit areas from uh, distribution. The cost is one per area deleted. And I don't know why there is, so cost for extinction, maybe. <clears throat> it's assuming that extinction is very rare. But anyway, so it uses this logic and tries to come up with ancestral areas, okay? Uh, so here's the, uh, here's an example. Uh, so the species names have now been replaced with areas, A, B, C. Now the question is, what are the areas of the internal node? So let's just concentrate on this part of the phylogeny. I've just known it up. Okay, so if you go by some of the rules that we just discussed now, if this is A, this is B, this has to be A. It can't be B, C, or D, or there is no D here, right? <clears throat> Similarly, this is B, B, so this has to be B. Okay, these two are A and B, so this could either be A, B, or AB, okay? <clears throat> 
uh, all of that is B, so that is B, that is B, that is B, okay? Um, now we can think of number of different scenarios and see which scenario gives us the least number of dispersals. Right, so this is again parsimony. So we are, we, are, we are here. Let's say, okay, that's B, so I'm gonna put a B here. Let's say one B here. From here to here, you are adding A. So it's dispersal to region A. Okay, that's one change. Uh, maybe these two ancestral areas were A, B. There would be two extinction events. No, it's not as parsimonious as this. So we can eliminate that. Maybe this is B and this is AB. So from here, you're adding A and then it continues to be AB down here, but then there has to be an extinction or in area A over here, right? So what you basically realize is that <clears throat> this is the most parsimonious uh, solution. You can also try putting just A here or just B here, you know, <clears throat> and trying the different uh, combinations and you'll realize that uh, uh, this is the most parsimonious solution. So what is this telling us? It's basically telling us that among the three areas, the center of origin of this group was area B. There was in situ speciation in area B and one of the lineages then dispersed to area A. Remember, this is only in this, this part, okay? I mean, once we include all of this, then, you know, the story will be very different. Anyway, uh, there was a dispersal to area A, followed by allopatric speciation. <clears throat> and you had, uh, you know, multiple species here. Within area B, in this lineage, again, there, there has been in situ speciation. Right. <clears throat> so this is how this works, but it uses cladogram. So it's not taking the time component into consideration. So this is an, a problem with this method. If you recall ancestral character reconstruction, when we are using parsimony, it's the same problem. It uses a cladogram. And time co it does not take time component into consideration. <clears throat> so that's why you, we use a, and, and you know, this is very similar to ancestral uh, character reconstruction, up pass, down pass, and all that. So it use, uses similar logic. <clears throat> Except in this case, extinction and dispersal are penalized. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, Diva now is also in another uh, package called uh, RASP, which it does something called SDIVA which takes into consideration topological uncertainty, but that's, <clears throat> we'll just show you how this works, uh, but anyway, but this, this is still Diva. But the, pro the point is, <clears throat> Diva uses cladogram and does not take into consideration the time component. So <clears throat> there's another program called Lagrange that uses a likelihood approach to come up with ancestral areas for the internal node. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> the simplest model there is somewhat similar to Jukes uh, uh, Cantor. So instead of bases, you have areas, and you simulate uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, range evolution on the tree. Okay. Uh, we will be using another, so Lagrange uh, is, the, uh, uh, is the earliest version, but we'll be using a program called BioGeo Bio Bears, uh, which has additional features, and, but then it's again likelihood approach <coughs> uh, to understand the uh, biogeography of some of these groups. Uh, yeah, Lagrange has something called jump dispersal, but anyway, we can, we can come back to that later. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not going to get into the details of how, uh, oh, this is called DEC model, dispersal, extinction, cladogenesis, the model that uh, this program uses. So I'm not going to get into the details of DEC model, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand <clears throat> how this ancestral reconstruction is actually done 
in, in, in parsimony framework, but we'll be using a, a deck model. Uh, <clears throat> so that's about uh, a brief introduction of uh, biogeography, historical biogeography. Uh, any questions? Jump dispersal. Yes. <clears throat> so, I, to me, both are dispersals. I don't, I don't quite understand the, the the difference there. But anyway, jump dispersal is is more like uh, if you have a long distance dispersal, a chance event where individuals uh, say <clears throat> from the mainland land up in an island. Okay. And uh, uh, and basically get isolated there, uh, so that is sort of a jump dispersal. Now, how how do they get to the island? Uh, often, you know, when you have uh, <clears throat> a storm, many times you know you have huge trees that gets uh, washed into the ocean, and if this animal happens to be on one of those logs, after a couple of months, it land, lands up on an island. Now it's completely isolated from everything in the mainland, and if it is a gravid female, starts to reproduce. You basically have uh, a new species in a very short time, right? So that is what is it called? Founder event speciation, right? Aritro? Jump, jump dispersal. Yeah. Yeah. So it's called <coughs> founder event speciation. Whereas the regular dispersal would be, say, between India and Sri Lanka. When the sea level goes down, the two land masses get connected, and animals can actually disperse. So that will be a, a much longer process. You know, and The sea level slowly begins to rise, so that it takes a longer time for these animals to get isolated and all that. So it's not like a jump dispersal. So, uh, uh, Lagrange uses the deck model, and uh, the program that we'll be using, uh, BioGeoBears, Bio uses something called, also uses something called deck plus J, which is uh, deck plus jump dispersal. So you can ask for that option. It's a nice <coughs> addition to the model, especially in, uh, for groups that you suspect might have undergone jump dispersal, groups that are found in islands, right? So yeah, that's uh, that's jump, jump dispersal. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, is it the same as phylogeography or is it different? Than no, phylo phy biogeography is, you know, you're looking at multiple species, phylogenies of multiple species and trying to understand how their distributions came about. Phylogeography is uh, looking at spatial distribution of genetic variation within a species. But and uses trying to understand. Huh? Uses the same principle? Uh, somewhat of the same principle, but the tools we use are very different. Um, so, there we are more interested in trying to understand past events that have shaped spatial dis distribution of genetic variation within a species. Right? Here, it's not exactly genetic uh, 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 variation. I mean, one can say that you know each species is different from the other species, so in a way, it's genetic variation at the higher level. But this is more species distribution maps, right? You're looking at species distributions and trying to understand what past events have shaped that. Uh, and in case of phylogeography, geography, you also use a lot more population genetic tools. <clears throat> OK, any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, maybe Chinta can, uh, I'll just stop this.